All right, everybody, welcome in. I've brought in the online audience now. Welcome to your new favorite class, ME429 Composite Materials. So everyone, um, I think you should be able to hear me online. Let me know if you can't. Uh, you might have to adjust your volume up or down a little bit, depending on how muted it is, but uh, we'll do the best with what we have. So I have a handful of people here uh, in the classroom, which is nice. Good to see some, uh, some smiling faces, or I guess smiling eyes, just like the commercial. Smile with your eyes. Um, and nice to see many of you online. It looks like we have 20 or so online. So glad that we could all kind of come together uh, various ways and good to see or quote unquote see all of you. Uh, I've got it set up here so that uh, I have a writing pad off to my right. And what is on my writing pad off to the right is the same thing as what's projected on the board behind me. And I will share the writing pad with uh, both the individuals online and I will project what's on the writing pad to the board behind me. So everybody that's in this lecture, whether you're in person or whether you're online, is going to get basically the same material, uh, except, you know, from my perspective, I enjoy actually having some people here to, to talk and see. Uh, so today is going to be kind of just your standard syllabus day, and we'll do a brief introduction to composites. Uh, and so uh, let me just check the chat really quick to make sure that all these people can hear me well. And Alex says loud and clear. Uh, Okay, great. Looks like we got thumbs up all in the chat, so that's nice. Uh, if the mask gets to a point where it's kind of muffled with the headphone set, uh, please let me know in the chat, and I'll do the best I can to sort of rearrange my microphone. Okay, thanks. So first things first, we've got to talk about the syllabus, uh, and let's just outline what's going on in the class. So I'm going to be using Blackboard for this class, and you should all have access to that. Uh, I think a lot of people are going towards Canvas now, but I still prefer to use sort of the old Blackboard methodology. Uh, I'll adopt Canvas when they force me to with uh, at knife point. <laughs> okay. Um, in the meantime, I'll use Blackboard. I'll post my lecture notes there. I'll post homework. So, I'll, you know, when the time comes for exams, we're going to do that virtually. I'll post my exams there as well. So uh, that'll be the platform. So if you don't have access to the Blackboard site, please let me know and we'll get you on there. All right. Uh, so with that in mind, let's just dive in right on the syllabus and we'll go through it together. So I'm going to bring the syllabus in here now to uh, both screens, so everybody should be able to sort of see the syllabus at this point. Um, let's see if I can move this over. All right, so I'm going to share my screen with the people in the online world, uh, so you can hopefully see that. All right, so let me know uh, if you not see the syllabus uh, in the online land, but you should be able to see it at this point, and everybody in the classroom can see it on the board, and I can verify because I'm here. Rawr. All right, so this is ME429, composite materials. This is a little bit of 3005 on steroids, right? So uh, 3005, you're doing a lot of advanced mechanics topics, how do materials deform under certain loads and moments and torques, et cetera. And we take that idea and we extend it to materials that do not behave the same in all directions. So isotropic materials like aluminums and metals and most ceramics, regardless of their orientation, with how you load them, they're going to behave in more or less the same way. But when you think about a composite material that has more than one constituent, like a, let's say a tree that has you know fibers running through it, it's going to behave differently along, let's say, the direction of the trunk than across the trunk. And that's just naturally because how the material is structured and how it grows uh, in the wild. So we're going to talk in this particular class all about what types of composites you might see in engineering application and how do we analyze this. And so the class really goes in what I think is two parts. The first part is a very like material science-y perspective. So think about like what you did in Schaefer's class or if you took Barnicky, whatever, for your material science class, you're going to have a lot of like background information on what are the materials that go into composites, what are their general properties, uh, a lot of sort of qualitative, how do we manufacture composites, so more qualitative information. And then once we get into the back half, we'll do a lot more uh, mechanics stuff. So a lot more 3005-esque material, where you're talking about strength and stiffness and of these materials in various orientations. And specifically, once we get to the back half, we're going to talk about your advanced fiber reinforced composites, your carbon fiber epoxy, glass fiber epoxy. It's going to be the bulk of what we do for the mechanics portion of this class. Okay. So um, your instructor, that's me, Kevin Hart. If you were expecting a uh, someone else, uh, sorry to disappoint you. Uh, my office phone number is here. I'm going to be working a lot from home this uh, quarter, so you might not get me if you call me on my phone, but I will definitely be responsive by email. So my email's here. Uh, please send me an email if you can. My office here are listed uh, 10, 8 to 10. I'm going to have to change this on the syllabus. 
Um, it's going to have to be entirely virtual. So I've been told that we can't have student meetings in the office. Uh, my office isn't big enough for in-person meetings, so no in-person meetings. We'll just have to meet via Teams. And because of that, I'm actually going to need some time between when my office hours end and uh, when my class begins at 10 o'clock, because I have a 10 o'clock class. So I'm going to change my office hours to from 8 to 9.30 generally. Okay, So be aware of that. I'll send uh, another announcement. I'll change the syllabus. Class meetings, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Tuesday people, some of them made it here, so that's good. Um, the class, obviously, you guys are split into blocks, A, B, and C, based on last name, and you're eligible for an in-person lecture once per week, though by the attendance here, we only have seven, so maybe if you wanted to poke in once or twice in, in an off time, that's also fine. Um, the textbook for this class, uh, I would actually really encourage you to get this. I usually don't encourage people to get the textbook for this class, but this one's actually very good, not only for learning the material, but for practical application, like if you actually want to do composites in industry in the future. There's a lot of things on the back end of the book about testing composite materials and standards associated, and those sorts of things actually are quite useful. So I usually don't advocate for the book because I'm going to provide a set of notes for the class, but in this situation, I actually think this is a useful book to have. So if you're interested in composites and maybe you want to do composites in the future in the long run, this is actually a really good reference. Uh, right, so this course, I kind of went through the description, um, but I'll say one more time, we're mostly going to be analyzing composite materials, advanced fiber reinforced composite materials, really, once we get past the material science portion, um, and do some math on a lot of that. You have to have taken 3005 before this class. This is an absolute must prerequisite. So I think I've seen a lot of you in 3005. That's a class that I do teach. Um, if you have not taken 3005, good luck, okay? Good luck. Um, other suggested prerequisites, mechanics three, uh, linear algebra. We're going to do actually quite a bit of linear algebra in this class. You'll use MATLAB in the back half of this course. So uh, you should be familiar with linear algebra concepts. And then material science is something you probably should have all taken at this point and going to be a nice add-on that you can have in your tool bag when it comes to talking about some of the material science you things from this course, like what's a polymer, what's a polymer chain. We're going to talk about these things specifically for composites as well. Okay. Other prerequisites here listed by topic, you can kind of go through this on your own. All right, so here's, we're getting into the sort of the meat of the schedule. And I'm kind of breaking the schedule down on the left-hand side of this sort of flowchart by the general topic that we have. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit so maybe we can see kind of what's happening on the left-hand side here. Um, first is materials and manufacturing. We talk about what materials generally go into composites, how we manufacture high-end composite materials. So... Uh, Again, fiber reinforced composites that might go into aircraft structures. Later on, uh, we'll get into the micro mechanical models. So these are models that tell you how, uh, let's say, a fiber interacts with the matrix around it on a very micro scale. Okay, so how can we predict the properties of a composite as a whole by just looking at one fiber in a surrounding matrix of material? Okay, so that's a very simplistic model. And then we'll break that model and push it even further to talk more generally about anisotropic materials. So anisotropic being the opposite of isotropic, meaning we're going to look at um, how materials respond if they don't have the same material properties in all directions. Okay. Our first midterm is going to be Thursday, October 15th and week 6th. So the first midterm will be focused on a lot of that material science -y stuff, qualitative stuff, how to manufacture composites, and very basic models about material properties. So if you have this fiber embedded in this matrix with these material properties, what will be the properties of the composite at the end? All right. Uh, then in the back half of the course, we'll really expand that into more structures as opposed to individual fibers or micromechanical models. We'll look at single lamina. So a lamina is a very thin layer uh, a composite material. So uh, basis for a lot of like skins for aircraft structures are thin lamina uh, mechanics. Uh, and then we'll look into laminates, which is a, a sort of a thicker compilation of many, many stacks of individual composite layers. Okay, so that's kind of the uh, the outline for for the course. Uh, the way that we're going to grade this course, um, you're going to have homework, which will be turned in sort of weekly. We'll have one midterm, one final, and then I'm going to ask you to write two documents that'll be anywhere from three to five pages. So, not very long. Three pages, double space is really not that long. So. Stop crying. Everyone here is crying. You should see them. They're all crying. Okay. Um, no crying at home either. Okay. Uh, really simple documents. And most of what we cover for those documents will be done in class. So we'll have a manufacturing breadth document, which is a little bit 
detail about some manufacturing methods for composites, and then we'll have a depth document. So the depth will be, you know, sort of part two of this. Everyone will write a breadth paper where you're talking about the very basic manufacturing processes, which you know we'll get into a little bit later. And then after you hand that in, I will each assign you a depth document, which you'll have to write about in a little bit more detail. So a variety of composite manufacturing methods, and you can go into depth on, on one that I assigned. All right. Um, you can read about the policies. Um, I've kind of talked about them already. Come to lecture if you can, if you want to in person, otherwise mostly online. Your homeworks, there's going to be about six or so of them this quarter. They're going to be due to my email inbox. I don't want any physical copies, you know, COVID. I don't want any physical copies. Uh, just send them to my email. I'll respond to your email with uh, graded comments, and you can you can get your grades for your homeworks through my email response. Okay, I did that kind of last quarter. It seemed to work out pretty well. Right. Uh, when I grade the homework, I'll grade one problem thoroughly for 80% of the grade, and then the remainder of the grade will just be completion of the homework. Right. So I'll just kind of spot check the remainder to see if you did the rest. All right. Formatting for homework assignments. You can read the details there. Your adults. Well, suspicious. Um, Exams, how we're going to do this, everyone will have to do, take the exam virtually. So get at your house or wherever you're going to be virtual for this particular class. It'll be done on Teams. I'll distribute the exam maybe a minute before the 4 o'clock bell rings, quote unquote bell. And then you'll just do the exam on a piece of paper in front of you. And at the very end, after 50 minutes have elapsed, take a picture with your phone or scan it in and email it to me. Okay, So that's how the exams are going to work. Worked really well last quarter when I had to do it, so I think I'm going to stick with that. Right? Manufacturing document assignments. Uh, as I said, there's one breadth document and one depth document. Everyone will write the same breadth document, but you'll each be assigned a different depth document with the various topics that I will assign to you. Okay? So there's a timeline there that you can see approximately when each one is due. So here's the breadth document due Thursday, October 8th, and the depth document due Tuesday, November 3rd. Cheating, dishonesty, don't do it, rar, etc. cetera. Uh, COVID-19, they ask us to put this statement in here for uh, you guys. Uh, again, just wear a mask, stay at distance. If you're feeling sick, don't come to class. At this point, hopefully I don't need to like hammer this home, okay? You've probably been drilled into this, into your brain, rar. Okay, if you're sick, don't come. And like, if you're in the dorms, try to maintain your distance. Don't be hanging out at bars at like one in the morning with no masks on. I drove down Water Street the other day at like midnight. And there's all these people just like out there on the streets, two inches away from each other, yelling. I'm like, oh my god, we're all we're all in trouble. But I'm sure we'll be fine. Just be responsible. Okay. Any questions from people here or in the in the chat online? I think I have one question from the online world. Nope, just someone give me the thumbs up. I'm the best. Questions? Anyone? Okay, that's all this available on Blackboard. I'll have to make a change about the office hours, but it should mostly stay as it is. Okay, so the remainder of the time, I want to introduce the class. That is, talk about what is a composite, what's going to happen in this class, what are composites that you might see naturally in the world, and, and, and what's going to go on um, for this particular class. So let me bring in that set of notes, and hopefully we can all sort of see this now. And we should all have the introduction of composites notes in front of us now. So this uh, slide deck is available on Blackboard. Again, you can you can see that there. And I'm just going to kind of talk my way through this. Uh, the first maybe week and a half or so is going to be PowerPoints and, and discussion uh, via PowerPoint, just because a lot of the front end material, like I said, is very qualitative, and it's better to kind of show pictures of what I'm talking about rather than me trying to draw it. Anybody that's had me in the past, you know, my Pictionary skills, solid two out of ten, solid. Okay. So uh, you don't want to see me drawing uh, nacre or wood or bone on the board. Trust me. All right. What is a composite? So it's the basis for this class. We better define what it is right from the get-go. Um, a composite is a multi-phase material where you can distinguish the individual phases inside of the piece. Okay. So two or more physically distinct materials that you can see inside of the piece which exhibit properties that are superior in some way to that of its constituents. And that has a little bit of like leeway and leniency to it. Um, so you have to sort of justify a composite material 
being two pieces together that are some way better than what they would be if they were individually separated. Okay. So when I say physically distinct, you may have talked about like alloyed aluminum in your material science class, which has like some portions of aluminum, maybe some titanium or chromium thrown in there uh, as an alloying agent. Those are not composite materials. You cannot physically distinguish the chromium from the aluminum in those alloys unless you have a very, very powerful microscope. So when I talk about them being physically distinct, it's like, you know, uh, fibers running through collagen in a wood tree. Okay, it's very easy to see the fibers in wood. I can see it on this table right in front of me. Okay, it's very easy to distinguish the two individual phases there. All right, so these composites are generally going to be comprised of three components. Most people think two. The answer is three, right? It's a good test question. So three components, matrix, which is the continuous phase, and it's protective, usually lightweight phase. Some examples might be epoxy or collagen or cement. It drives me crazy when people think cement and concrete are the same thing. They're not the same thing. Then there's a reinforcement phase, which is usually discontinuous and it is the strong and stiff phase. So when you're thinking of like a fiber reinforced composite, it'd be the fiber in that particular composite. So carbon fiber is a reinforcement phase. Rebar in concrete is a reinforcement phase where the concrete is the matrix phase, right? So hydroxyapatite, this is sort of a mineral that makes up your bone. Um, and so the hydroxyapatite mineral is reinforced with some uh, components to make up your bone, right? Uh, so is the reinforcement inside your bone. So xylem and phloem, this is the, the portions of the tree that I was talking about. I'll show examples of that. The third component that makes up a composite, and this is very, very important, is the interface between the reinforcement and the matrix phase. If you do not have an interface between your matrix and your reinforcement, you do not have a composite. Okay? So you have to have load carrying capability or load sharing capability between your reinforcement and your in your uh, matrix phase, your continuous phase. Otherwise, you could be in a lot of trouble, all right? You need to have that sharing capability to really have a, a good, strong composite. It is the bond between the matrix and the reinforcement that makes a good composite, all right? Many factors kind of account for the strength of this bond, and we're going to talk about this specifically, but you have to have a reinforcement, you have to have a matrix, and you have to have an interface. If you don't have those three things, you don't have a composite, all right? Rawr! All right? So here's a, a cross section of a glass fiber reinforced composite. And it's maybe a little dim, uh, maybe a little washed out by the projector here. But I want to just maybe draw attention to uh, some of the materials that you might be able to see. So uh, I, I think you guys can see my arrow on the internet version. But sort of this phase here that is sort of this lighter phase, this is epoxy phase. So, you know, epoxy, if you've ever like mixed a two part epoxy at home, you mix part A with part B and it hardens. OK, so this is a hardened epoxy that you see here, this sort of like later phase. And around it, you have kind of these fibers that are running across the plane and individual fibers here that are sort of coming into and out of the plane. OK, so these if I were to blow this up um, and zoom in way on those, you'd be able to see individual glass fibers that are sort of bundled together as a mass. Okay, those individual glass fibers make up what is the reinforcement phase of this particular composite material. So each one of those glass fibers there is approximately 10 microns in diameter. So you're looking at thousands of glass fibers in that particular image. So you see here the reinforcement phase, which is this continuous phase, and it runs not just in this pocket here, but throughout the entire composite. And you also see the fibrous phase, which is used to carry the load and give stiffness, um, which here has got like the 0, 90 orientation for this particular image. You have zero degrees, 90 degrees um, to each other, where we have a bundle of fibers that are sort of coming into and out of the page here and here. And you have a bundle of fibers that are sort of running across the page that have been cut through here and here to give you this image. So this is an optical view of a cross section of a glass fiber and epoxy composite. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these fiber reinforced composites once we get to the, the deep mechanics portion of this class. I have a question in the chat from Jonathan. He says the matrix and reinforcement are physical properties and the interface is more of a chemical property. I would consider that to be a good analysis, but um, the interface itself can be quantified mechanically. So if you've thought of like, let's say, a piece of steel inside concrete, 
how much energy does it take to pull that steel out? That gives you some information about the interfacial strength between the rebar and the concrete. So there's some physical properties that you could be able to measure with like rebar and concrete, for instance, as an example. So it's not just the chemical property, but you can actually me measure the physical property itself as well. Continuing, some types of composites. There are natural composites, um, probably that you've seen out in the world, wood, obviously, cellulose and lignin. There's indanker, which is uh, the pearl that you might see if you're lucky enough to break open a clamshell and see the pearl inside. Um, and nacre is kind of an interesting material in of itself in that it's uh, argonite platelets and polysaccharide proteins. So the protein is actually kind of like a ductile matrix phase. And the argonite platelets give kind of the reinforcement. And it makes pearls actually incredibly strong and stiff, yet also very ductile. So you try to like fracture a pearl, it's actually quite difficult to do. So if you took a hammer and you banged on a pearl, it wouldn't fracture right away. And that's because there's a lot of tough reinforcement, which is the polysaccharide protein, which is kind of interesting. All right, some traditional um, composite materials. Concrete would be an example. You have the aggregate, which is all the stones inside of the cement, which is the matrix. So the cement is the continuous phase of concrete. People confuse these things all the time. Um, so when you say, yeah, I'm walking on the cement, it's probably not true. You're probably walking on concrete. Concrete is the composite, cement is the matrix phase of the composite, and the aggregate is the reinforcement in the concrete. Okay, so um, civil engineers will get really upset with you if you use cement and concrete interchangeably because they're definitely not the same thing. All right. Um, but we're mostly going to talk about in this class, and why I've highlighted it in red, is advanced composites. So mostly glass fiber and epoxy and carbon fiber and epoxy, um, which is your traditional aerospace grade, you know, wind energy grade kind of epoxy fiber reinforced materials. But some other kind of quote unquote advanced composites might be like dental fillings, which are actually like pretty advanced composites themselves. So UV curable polymer and some calcium reinforcement is usually what makes up sort of those tooth colored uh, dental fillings these days. So let's talk generally about why composites are awesome. And not just because I said so, but you should take that for, for what it is anyways. Because I said so, like your parents, all right? Go to your room, because I said so. All right, no, why composites? All right, first and foremost, incredible strength and stiffness to weight ratio. Now, there are stiffer and stronger materials that exist than the carbon fiber reinforced epoxy composite, all right? Steel is very strong and very stiff, but steel is also heavy as all heck, okay? So if you're trying to make an aircraft and you want to have as much fuel efficiency as possible, you want strength and stiffness to weight ratio, what is known as specific strength and specific stiffness. So composites are the kings of specific strength and specific stiffness. If you want stiffness to weight ratio, strength to weight ratio, composites, that's where it's at. All right, you have... Additionally, with composites, some more control over some secondary properties that you might want. So things like thermoelectrical and magnetic properties. Okay, let's say I want to make a electrically conductive material, uh, and I want it mostly to be polymer. Well, I could have a polymeric material where I run a electrical conduit through it. Okay, so now I have electrical properties, and I have a composite because I have this, you know, metal wire running through the polymer. And so if I'm curious about what are the mechanical properties of this metal wire inside this polymer, well, that's a composites problem. So you have to be able to deal with that, All right? So here are some, um, here's a graph in the lower left that kind of just highlights the specific strength of composites versus some other materials that you might have. So uh, epoxy, steel, aluminum, here they are on the left-hand side. You see aluminum outperforming steel because generally aluminum is, is still pretty stiff and strong but is much, much lighter than steel. So we see aluminum beating out steel. But if you look at composites by comparison, it's like, what are you doing? Like, it, you just got blown away. Sun, like, step off. All right, specifically, if you look at this carbon fiber and epoxy composite compared to steel or aluminum, it's two or three times better specific stiffness. All right, so great. There's also some fatigue and damping properties that you can control using composites, which is nice. If you want to think about arresting a crack with a series of fibers, you could probably design your material to do that. All right, so a little bit of control there for composites. And they are up and coming, I will tell you. People are afraid of composites generally because they're complicated. All right, I'm not going to lie. 
there are a lot of applications that we could have in this real world that would be better suited for composites, but people just don't understand them because they're complicated and they're like, oh, I'll just make it out of aluminum, you know? But economically speaking, if you like took the time to understand and utilize composites in certain locations, they would be better off for your business, for your crane, for your aircraft, for your boat, for your vehicle, for whatever, you know? But people are afraid and there's a lot of complication with composites, so people generally don't use them. But people who forecast the economics of composites in the future say that definitely composites will take over. Um, here is a, a, a newspaper article that talks about composites taking over in the energy sector. And when you're talking about lighter, stiffer materials, you're always going to attract energy sector. Okay. These improvements include increased use of lightweight materials such as advanced or ultra high tensile strength steels, aluminums, magnesium alloys, polymers, and carbon fiber reinforced composite materials. The integration of lightweight materials is especially important if more complex parts can be manufactured as a single unit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Extending life, reducing costs, all the good things that you would associate. Okay. So composites, they're the best. You guys do Ashby plots when you're in um, your material science class? Yes? No? Ashby plots? No. Okay. So this is an Ashby plot. Um, this is the specific strength and specific stiffness of various materials plotted on a logarithmic scale on both the X and the Y axes. What I want to point out in this particular chart is there's classifications of materials. Okay. So woods, you know, steels, metals, alloys, fiber reinforced composites. And basically the further up and to the right you are, the better the specific properties. So specific strength and specific stiffness. So if you're designing an aircraft, you want to get as far to the up and to the right as you possibly can on this particular chart. So what we see is that um, ceramics kind of dominate the upper right, but what do we know about ceramics generally? Why do we not use ceramics in aircraft? Yeah, they're brittle. All right, so you hit a bird, you explode it. Okay, so yeah, good Ethan. Ethan is participating in the chat. Good job, Ethan. All right, so uh, yeah, they're brittle. So the next best bet is kind of moving down into the left a little bit in this Ashby plot, and we're going to get into the area of fiber reinforced polymeric materials and um, metals and alloys. So when you see aircraft structures, aluminum is common, and also fiber reinforced composite materials. So you're going to make a chart that looks a little bit like this for your first homework, okay? Economic forecast on composites. I sort of alluded to this already, but composites are coming, okay? And if you have the ability to deal with composites, you're employable. Like, no joke. All right, some, there's these, like, marketing companies that their whole job is to, like, predict areas of the economy that will grow. And so there's this economic forecast from this one particular marketing company. They spend, like, so, like, hundreds of thousand dollars on these reports. It's insane. But anyways, this one talks about carbon fiber reinforced plastics. And here's a compound annual growth rate of 10.5%. If I told you you could invest in a stock at 10.5%, you would dump your life savings into that. Okay. So 10.5% annual growth rate for any sector is incredibly good. All right. So especially like the automotive sector, if we look down here, the automotive application segment of the global CFRP market is projected to grow it up compound annual growth rate uh, between 2017 and 2022. That's right now, all right? So even we're in like this COVID situation, they're still manufacturing composites like crazy. Like you still have to have energy, you still have to have windmills, you still have to have, you know, aircraft and boats to transport things. Like you still have to have all that stuff. The North American region is expected to lead the CFR pre-market. That's us, okay? So let's do that, okay? That's up to you guys. I just to tell you how to do it. I don't actually want to do it myself. It's, it's up to you guys, okay? You got to do that. All right, faster growth rates than any other material sector, okay? Any other sector. It's like not even close, including 3D printing, right? Yeah, you've heard all this about 3D printing. Composites grow faster than 3D printing. Like it's, yeah, okay, there you go. Here's an example, the Dreamliner. To me, the Dreamliner is like this, step between what composites could do and what they are now doing. They call it like the valley of death, all right? Like, let's say you invent this amazing technology in a lab somewhere and no one is willing to implement it because the cost of implementing it from some laboratory technology to actual production is immense, okay? It's called the valley of death in the world of industry. And there's a lot of technologies that have been invented that have not actually seen long-term production or, or growth production because it's just too expensive to implement or even try to implement those technologies. This Dreamliner represents this incredible step for composites going from where composites are maybe used just a little bit in non-structural components of aircraft to now it's like 
to all structural components, 50% composites by weight, okay? And we know composites are light, so it's more like 70% by volume, okay? And it's just like this incredible step forward for composites and other large sectors of the economy, wind, vehicle, transportation, marine, etc., cetera, are, are starting to follow uh, now that the Dreamliner has sort of kind of made its progression. And this is like, you know, the figure is about a decade old now. The Dreamliner has been eh, maybe eight years old. Um, so it's coming, if not already here, and you need to know how to, how to use composites. Automotive sector, there's a lot of vehicles now making their chassis, structural material, out of fiber reinforced composites. Here's an example of the BMW i3, chassis made out of carbon fiber reinforced epoxy. Okay, this is a structural material inside of a vehicle. You can make the vehicle lighter, more fuel efficient, so on and so forth, all good things. Energy sector, windmills, all over the place. You drive down 57 in Illinois or, or I don't know, I drive down any highway. I mean, you drive down 94, you see them also. So see them all over the place. And fiber reinforced composites make up the backbone of these, of these large, huge windmills, right? Other examples of composites that you might not necessarily be so obvious, lithium ion batteries. Okay, so lithium ion batteries are actually a composite material. You have this polymeric binder that holds all of the charged particles, right? So PVDF, this is a polymeric material, um, and then the silicon particles or the lithiation particles are held in this sort of binder. So this is a composite material, and when it contra contracts and expands with lithiation of your battery, um, this is a composites problem. And when you're charging and uncharging your battery, what's happening is your battery is expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. Every single time that you charge it and expend that charge. So this fatigue problem is a composite problem. It's constantly expanding and contracting, and so you need to know how to like deal with that. So over time, your battery loses its ability to charge, and that's because this fatigue problem causes cracks to grow, and your battery becomes less efficient, and that's what's happening when you have a less efficient lithium ion battery that just can't hold its charge well. This is a composite problem. It's a composite material. Okay. Other examples in the medicine and health, I talked about dental resins. All right, so it's a, sort of a stiff... Um, reinforcement phase inside of a UV curable polymer. So if you ever got a filling at the dentist and they shine that like purple light on your tooth, you ever have that? I got them all the time because I drink too much soda. Um, yeah, that purple light they're shining, that's a UV light that they're using to cure the polymer phase of the composite that is your dental resin, right? So that's what's happening at the dentist. You can actually like feel it warming up a little bit when it's in your mouth if you actually like try to pay attention. Um, so yeah, there you go. It's a polymeric material with a, with a hard reinforcement. However, not with all the drawbacks, obviously. You knew this. Why don't we just make everything out of composites? They sound so wonderful. Okay. Um, right, anisotropy. So if you make a fiber reinforced composite out of carbon, fiber, and epoxy, and the fibers are just running in one direction, right? Well, the strength of that particular material parallel to the fibers is going to be very high. So here we're talking a strength of like 1.4 GPA. Quite high, right? That's stronger than me. And I, you know, lift on the regular. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm getting fat and old. Okay, so along the fibers, very strong. But across the fibers, oh my gosh, so weak, right? It's like that cartoon where you like flex and then it like goes under. Like whoop, like that's, that's how strong it is across. Like think about trying to chop a tree, all right? If you chop along like the direction of the fiber, it's very easy to split the log. If you try to chop across the tree, it's like very difficult. Right? So this is like an anisotropic idea. It's like it's very easy to split along the fibers, right? And it's very difficult if you're trying to chop across the fibers, right? So it has this like anisotropic behavior. And we have to be able to like deal with that and anticipate that. And it makes designing structures that are gonna be bearing weight complicated. Right? They have very low fracture toughness generally, fiber reinforced composites. Okay, if you've ever like used epoxy or had a block of epoxy at home. Um, really low toughness, so generally brittle. They're not as brittle as ceramics, but can be approaching that of ceramics, especially if you're like a glass fiber reinforced epoxy, because glass itself is a ceramic, and so if you have a ceramic inside of a brittle epoxy, it's not going to do all that well, okay? So that is one of the drawbacks as well. Typically, we measure fracture toughness in units of um, <laughs> MPA root meters, it's kind of a, a unit for fracture toughness, and we can have a general comparison here of like aluminum to epoxy. So epoxy is the backbone of a lot of composites. 
And aluminum has a fracture toughness anywhere of 30 to 50 MPa root meters is about common, same for steel. And epoxy, about 30 times less. All right, so about one MPa root meter is common. That means if I drop a, you know, a plate of aluminum from this height onto the ground, I mean, it's not gonna fracture, right? It's, it's silly. But if I drop a sheet of epoxy from this height onto the ground, I don't know, it's probably not gonna survive very well. If it's very brittle, it's likely to fracture and, and break. So you gotta be mindful of, of those sorts of things um, with composites, all right? Also, the failure modes for composites really complicated. If you think about fibers running through a matrix phase and um, it could have debonding between fibers, the fibers could rupture, the matrix could crack. Um, you could have all sorts of different failure modes and repairing that damage can actually be really difficult as well. So a lot of times if you have composites that are being utilized in reality, you don't just sort of repair it. You say, all right, there's some bird strike and my composite exploded and now I just got to replace the whole thing. Okay, uh, so complicated. Um, and so here are some of these pictures of uh, some of the complicated failure modes that I'm talking about. And we'll we'll show some more of these pictures a little bit later, but you have this internal cracking that can occur where here we have some fibers that are running in and out of the page where this crack has gone through that. Here's just a pure matrix phase. Uh, the crack is running through that as well. Um, here's a, a composite that's been struck head on. So you're looking at sort of the face of a thin composite that's been struck. And you see sort of like fiber fracture and perforation on the inside here that's, that's occurred. Uh, you can also have delamination between fabric layers. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the point is that failure of composites is not a trivial thing. It's complicated and can be expensive to repair and expensive to even detect that that has occurred. And if you have not detected it's occurred and you still are using them in operation, it can be really expensive, meaning your plane crashes and you're out of business. Okay, So failure modes are complicated. This does really affect uh, the real world. This is an article from the Chicago Tribune about the Dreamliners that I talked about earlier in this lecture, which was a great achievement, generally, that they could go into production, but they're not without their flaws. They have delamination issues, which you kind of uh, see right here. A delamination, which is a separation of layers that can occur, of fabric layers, and that leads to a failure mode that's somewhat difficult to detect and can be problematic, okay? So it was affecting a lot of these Dreamliners because of the way they were manufactured and can be a problem, okay? So uh, just wrapping up this slide, uh, last thing I'll say for composites is traditionally like unreinforced plastics, metals and ceramics have been like the default for engineering. And in a lot of situations, those choices are fine and perfectly legitimate, okay? But there are a lot of situations where composites would be better and they have not been utilized. And I think people are generally afraid of composites and I don't want you guys to be those people. Okay. I want you to realize that, oh, if my crane were lighter here, it would be less expensive fuel cost. Okay. If you can design a particular part out of composites, it makes it very, you know, marketable to some of these companies. All right. So I hope you are all excited about composites as I am. I'm still excited about them um, all these years later. Uh, and that's going to be it for the lecture today. So thanks for coming. Uh, the C block will be eligible on Thursday. I hope to see some of you guys in person. Um, and thanks for uh, coming online, audience. Thank you as well.